I come from the, the world of Silicon Valley and the world of bits. And when I think of, of your world, I think of your world as taking responsibility for a lot of the atoms in the world. And this issue of how bits and atoms are interacting with each other is becoming increasingly central to global business. And this whole digitization of, of more and more of the world. Uh, there's a guy named Mark Andreessen has a saying, software is eating the world. And, and, and you're right in the middle of that. The, the, the supply chain and the manufacturing chain globally is right in the middle of that. So I thought we might take a minute at the beginning of this conference to just sort of put that a bit in perspective. Because guys like Sean and myself have been around here for quite a, quite a, a while. He, he referred to a guy named John Imlay from MSA. That, you have to go back pretty far in time to know who that was. But that was the beginning of, of uh, enterprise software back in the late 70s and, 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 and then into the 80s. And the thing that we were able to accomplish at that time was to build the initial systems of record the database systems that became the foundation for global commerce ever since. Started with the financial systems, HR systems, payroll, accounts payable, accounts receivable, got into supply chain, got into order processing, got into customer relationship management. All of that was being built, the foundations in the 80s, and that was in a back office and initially run on computer cards and then terminals, et cetera. The first big change happened in the 90s, and, and, and when uh, it was, uh, Sean was referring to Workday and how they said we went from mainframe systems to client server systems, the client server revolution took all the PCs and the desktops that were, that were personal computers and hooked them into the back office system. So for the first time, we would be able to actually get human beings engaged in the management and manipulation and analysis of some of these systems of record. So this is the first, if you will, systems of engagement. Still pretty limited uh, uh, to, to a desktop and to, frankly to specialists who could use analytical software and, and kind of try to figure out what was going on. And we were getting our first good reports and, the, and we could get custom reports and query and analysis and stuff like that. That led, by the way, that whole revolution led to an interesting phenomenon. At the end of the century, Y2K, there was an enormous anxiety about the systems of record uh, having date problems. So everybody updated all of their systems of record right at the end of the decade. And that led to a kind of a, 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 a deep pause in enterprise IT spending, because frankly, people overspent at the end of the 90s. And so the next decade was not a decade about enterprise IT. Enterprise IT was kind of on hold. The biggest thing that happened in the first decade of this century was things like virtualization and cloud computing and finding ways to make enterprise IT scale out better without being so expensive to, uh, to operate. What happened instead during that decade was consumer IT came out of nowhere to fundamentally change our, our social lives. And we, we have become a, you know, it's interesting, we used to talk about having a digital device but now everyone has a digital device, and in a developed economy, it's almost always a smartphone, and it's with you 24 by seven, and we are learning and accommodating a, a digital lifestyle. We're leading digitally mediated lives. It's very, it, it's very anxiety producing, particularly if you're a parent and you see your children, and your children are internalizing these digital devices in ways that look very foreign, but this is just the next generation of human human culture on the planet. This is how it is going to be to be a human being. And those of us in the room who grew up without it are, are trying to learn how to accommodate it. Well, what's interesting about that is this decade is now the decade in which the business systems are saying, look, just as we took the personal computer and we're able to integrate it into our back office systems with, and, and create an extension of our capability. Now what we want to do is take a look at these consumer systems, and say, which we're calling systems of engagement. So systems of record are based around building a database. Systems of engagement are about creating a user experience. So those are very, very different. But if we can take the collaboration and communication capabilities of these systems of engagement, and bring them to bear on business issues that have a part of their issue is in the system of record. Some shipment is shipping short, something is, is, is going late, some bill of lading has got the wrong country of origin, whatever the heck it is, with a person who's supposed to sort that out. And if they could start using some of these systems of engagements to accelerate that 
and to allow people to sort out for themselves through self-service as opposed to always having an intermediating operator, that could get pretty darn interesting. And that's kind of the, that's sort of the adventure, uh, the venture thesis of the decade. I spend time in a venture capital company on, on Mondays, more David Al Ventures. Systems of record aren't going away. The SAP and Oracle anchor systems, I think they're there for many decades to come. But systems of engagement are now going to be overlaid onto them, or at least that's the big bet that we can overlay these systems of engagement, we can modify them and make them work. And that's what I think GT Nexus and its partners and your whole community is looking at. So I want to give you some focus on that. So if you think about the impact of enterprise IT, two places it's happening. One is for those of you who are in B2C businesses. I talked to, to Trek, I talked to some people making Crocs. What's going on in your world, particularly at the retailer, apps are becoming the new thing. The consumer app is the new client. And leveraging big data in real-time analytics, the kind of stuff that Google does, that Amazon does so well, now all of a sudden all other retailers are going to have to do, or they're going to be out of business, and finding actionable signals out of digital noise. Because most of what this traffic is meaningless, but there are a few signals, how would you interpret it? Really, really tough computing problem. That's what the B2C guys are doing. B2C VPs of digital marketing are saying, who knew I had to hire math majors? Okay? But that's the, new, that's the new B2C. In the B2B world, which is, I think, more the world we're here today, bring your own device as the new client. So it's no longer the Windows PC. It's no longer the Wintel operating system. It could be an iOS device from Apple. could be a Google Android. could be a, could be a BlackBerry. could be a Microsoft Windows thing. But what we're trying to do is mobilize management. Management is no longer taking place in a building where you supervise people that come to work. It's happening across the world, and it's happening across an electronic footprint. And so facilitating collaboration is the new thing. And that's, so what I want to do in the rest of this talk is talk specifically about B2B, and, you know, which is largely still a community of digital immigrants, not digital natives. So people aren't feeling like, oh boy, I get to use some cool new thing. It's more it's like, oh, God, incoming, you know? And, and so how do we handle this sort of stuff? So if you look at the B2B global business dynamics, why, why do we really have to change? I mean, what's the pressure coming from? And it's coming from the fact that back in the 90s when we deployed all this client-server software, it went global. And the internet allowed us to transport work across oceans and to have an enormous impact on the economies of Asia. Very, very positive, challenging impact for our economy, enormously positive for them. But what outsourcing led to, of course, was a globalized world where, after a while, those economies started shipping goods back into our economies you know, uh, to compete onshore, pr pretty much on lower price initially, and then increasingly on, on goods. So you watch a company like Samsung, whose initial offerings were basically commodity-style offerings, now with the Galaxy 4 taking on Apple head-on, and in places like India, dominating. So what happens in that globalization thing is the first thing that happens is that you get into a new economy if you're coming from a low-cost manufacturing zone with a commoditized offer. And the commoditizing offer is good enough, but barely. And so what that causes the existing offers to do in order to maintain their profit margins, they have to start differentiating. So you start saying, OK, 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 we'll let the, little, the guy come in, but it's really not that good. We're a much better thing. But then this guy gets a little bit better and a little bit better. And now you have to differentiate a little bit more and a little bit more. And to do that, you have to specialize. You have to say, look, instead of spreading all of my spend across the entire bill of materials and across the end-to-end -end life cycle, I'm going to pick a place, a subset of the bill of materials and a subset of the life cycle where I'm going to be beyond good. But if I'm going to specialize there, I have to find some way to restructure so that I can offload the things I am not specializing in. We call this the difference between core and context. And making the decision about what's core, and that's where we're going to differentiate and specialize, means I have to make a decision about context, which is where I'm going to restructure and therefore outsource. And now I've got this thing as a cycle. And now you can start seeing that this cycle is just going to keep going round and round and round. And it's creating a kind of a Darwinian competition in which the people that can keep up can continue to leverage the benefits of this virtuous circle. But if you try to stop at any point, you get run over. So, it's, so there's now this, there's a kind of this inherent anxiety in global business because you can't stop. 
You just have to keep running. By the way, antelopes have the same feeling about lions. It's, 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 it's a universal idea. OK. So in that model, you say, so what is the adaptive response? If you read in Darwinism, what you see in Darwinism is when environments change, certain species thrive, other species get, get marginalized. Well, what's the adaptive response here? Well, the first thing is the structure of business, the fundamental structure is changing. When I joined business, and certainly in my father's era, businesses were organized as vertically integrated hierarchies. And they basically did everything from sand to systems if they were a computer company or whatever. They tried to integrate, vertically integrate the supply chain inside their company. The transaction costs were lower if you made it yourself. What's happened in the era of the internet and all these systems is the transaction costs of interacting with another company have dropped dramatically, which makes it increasingly efficient to do things outside of your company, not just inside of your company. And that's led to a new structure, which is much more horizontal in nature. It is much more likely that you are collaborating across the supply chain than trying to vertically integrate and report directly up inside one. So business networks, whether they're explicit or implicit, are displacing vertically integrated corporations. And that's why you see a lot of the jobs leaving the Fortune 500 and going into the mid-tier and small, uh, lower tiers uh, of the economy. Because that's where it's more efficient to get work done in a well-networked rule of law economy. Now, by the way, if you eliminate the network or you eliminate rule of law, you'll go back to vertically integrated. That's what happened during the Middle Ages. When the, when the Romans got, Roman roads got taken away, they all went back to the castles. So this is not irreversible, but right now we're playing the horizontal game. In the horizontal game, it's all about communication, coordination, and collaboration. So computing is, is now being put to a very, very different, much more systems of engagement than systems of record orientation to this new world. It's relationship management, troubleshooting. I need to talk to specific people. I need to talk with them over a high bandwidth medium, perhaps even video conferencing in real time. It, 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 it's, a, it's an add-on. It's not a replacement, but it's, it becomes increasingly strategic to do this. And the challenge then is how can I globally interact with peers? So the answers, you know, it's not that the answers are in the computer. Some of the answers are in the computer, but not all of them. And one of the answers in the computer is, is a bad one <laughs> that we're trying to change. So we're trying to troubleshoot or expedite or whatever so we're trying to do. So I need to get into other people's heads. So that's the game we're going forward. So how can I use technology in this new environment? Well, this is where you get to this notion of systems of engagement. And the way you th should think about systems of engagement is just to say, look, Whatever we have in the consumer environment, what would happen if we put the word enterprise in front of that word? So you do not want to do your business on Facebook. But if you had an enterprise Facebook, a kind of a LinkedIn for your industry, wouldn't that be helpful in terms of just keeping people? Where is Harry? Did Harry leave uh, Maersk and go over to? Wh what's he doing these days? I'd like to know, right? How do you keep up? If you had an enterprise YouTube, and you could send the, the video of the, of, of, of the broken uh, shipment container or the, or, or the whatever the problem is and, and, get, and get a diagnosis in real time, wouldn't that be helpful? Enterprise Twitter, I think, is called Chatter, right? So, so you, you, we're watching people do this, right? An app, isn't there an app for that? Couldn't I give my, my, my field force or my customer an app in order to engage with me? Sure you can. I mean, all of these things are possible. They require a different level of security, of reliability, of integration. So it's not likely that Facebook is going to create enterprise Facebook or Twitter is going to create enterprise Twitter. But someone will. But someone will. And, and platforms like Force.com and from Salesforce and, and GT Nexus itself may become an interesting platform where you start saying, look, couldn't we build some of that on top of this infrastructure going forward? And I think that's what you're going to see going forward. It takes an active imagination. But the idea is, what would I use this thing for in an enterprise context? And a lot of venture investment is going into this column, a lot. So you, I think you'll see lots of, so you Jive, Yammer, uh, uh, the chatter, that, that whole thing, Lithium, uh, these companies that are coming in to try to take these social engagement ideas and put them in service to business communities. Why do this? Well. Here's the, here's the deal. We've disaggregated the value chain. 
So now we, we get it. I don't, I'm not explaining anything new to you. It does take a network of companies to deliver anything end to end. The systems of records are providing the critical underpinnings, but we need some form of systems of engagement in order to manage the exceptions. The, the, and, and the exceptions as we, get, as we use more and more of these systems, although the percentage of exceptions is inevitably being reduced, the absolute number of them is inevitably increasing. So the management burden in that situation falls on the middle of the organization, which is an interesting thing because in the past, we spent an enormous amount of money in the 80s and 90s automating the bottom of the organization, what we called online transaction processing. We did it for order processing, we did it for, for uh, customer support, we did it for mm, inventory management. So, so the, we, we spent a lot of money on the bottom of the organization, and then we also spent a lot of money on the top of the organization. We've got business intelligence systems that allow us to extract information from these data warehouses and pre present it in all kinds of important ways. And, you know, in an unending effort to make our executives smart, which was very challenging, but we did our best, okay? But in the middle of this, we never spent anybody on the middle. The two things you got if you work in the middle of an organization in the last 15 years was a laptop and a Blackberry, and that was it. By the way, there are both kind, kinds of systems of engagement. But the heavy lifting in this new model is done in the middle. The CEO is too high and the transactional worker is too uninformed. So increasingly, we're gonna get more of a diamond shape rather than a pyramid shape to our employment footprint. And people in the middle who may be direct employees or who may be in some sort of contract relationship with the corporation are gonna be given more and more and more responsibility to make the nexuses and I think that's the exact right word, in the supply chain to actually connect and click and work properly. So what kind of IT do those people need? Okay. They need to work 24 seven from anywhere. It's a wireless networking world. It is not a wired networking world. So yes, we're gonna need all the wired infrastructure that Cisco and Juniper and all the people put in the ground, but now this the wireless footprint that's gonna have the bigger impact going forward. And then these smartphone devices, and then the ability to, to interact with our corporate stuff, but what do I do about the virus that he got from the, the, the consumer site? How do I keep that from getting into the enterprise stuff? So now you start talking about containers and security algorithms, and there's a lot of work to do here, but it's, it's IT for the middle tier. It's in the moment empowerment through systems of engagement. That's where the, that's where the opportunity is. On-demand access to systems of record. Those are two extremely easy phrases to say. It's about a decade's worth of work to do, roughly. I mean, for the, for, for, for the industry, for the IT industry as a whole, because it is an unnatural act to connect a system of record to a system of engagement. Systems of record are designed to be secure. They're designed to be protected. They are the single source of truth. In ingress and egress are highly guarded and only granted under very specific protocols. Systems of engagement is a complete open field, right? The whole point of a systems of engagement is come one, come all, whenever you want, however you want, as much as you want, do whatever you want. Which is great, I mean, in terms of taking the friction out of communication and, communi and collaboration, it's wonderful. But now imagine taking that and exposing it to this. And, and you're thinking, how in the world do you do that? And it takes a lot of software in the middle to do it. Now, none of that software is hard to imagine, and much of that software has been written, a version of that was written for a prior era. So I, I, I think I'm highly confident this problem gets solved in this decade, but it's a lot of work. And in any one situation, as you're working across a, a global footprint of many relationships, you should expect to see a wide variation in the ability of the, the, the least able and the most capable firm that you interact with. You're gonna see a wide variation, which over the decade will narrow but you have to take into account that dispersion as you, if, the earlier you deploy your systems of engagement commitments, the more you have to take responsibility for bringing on, on board the outliers. The longer you wait, the more likely the outliers will have, have somebody else will have brought them on board. So there's, as we're gonna see in a minute, there's competitive advantage in going early, but more work, and there is cost savings by going late, but you expose yourself to being marginalized. So uh, a decision to be made. Whole new architecture for enterprise IT though. The whole IT department is going through a revolution because it used to be systems of records geeks doing geeky stuff, right? And now the problem is 
somebody says, well, I want you to design a, 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 a program that has a good user experience. And the geek goes, user experience? I don't even have a good life experience. A user experience? I mean, so, so, so it's a challenge. It's a challenge. So part, a lot of partnering going on at this time. So the, the question, just a couple of things to leave you with. The first one is, well, when, when should I do this? I mean, where should, I mean this, is, this is a big change. Where, where, how should I focus my thinking about this? I think the key idea is when you're thinking about investing in a system of engagement, sit down with your line of business partners and your IT people, get them all in one room and talk about what are the key moments of engagement in our business? What are the moments that kind of make or break our success? And is there a recurrent moment? You know, is it the moment that the ship leaves the dock with or without? Is it, you know, what's the moment in our world? Is, is it a financing transaction that during the negotiation that makes or breaks the deal? What's the moment of engagement? Whatever it is, and you may have more than one, who represents us in that moment? In terms of job title, is it an agent, is it an employee? What are they doing? Is it a sales representative? Is it, a, is it an expediter? Is it a, is it a field support personnel? Who's, who's representing us in that moment of engagement? And then, which of these interesting ideas about systems of engagement, if we implemented, could change the efficiency or the effectiveness of our agent in that moment of engagement? That's a really interesting place to bring a line of business domain expert and an IT expert together. Because there's almost always something very practical and very uh, uh, enabling to do at that moment. And by focusing on that moment, you will create a project that matters as opposed to yet another pilot project with stuff that you're not quite sure what to do with. So I encourage you to do that. Use these questions to target the first project on a moment that matters. Don't do a meaningless pilot project. It just isn't worth it, okay? Do something that matters. The second thing has to do with when. And uh, you know, Sean was referring to a book called Crossing the Chasm. In Crossing the Chasm, what we learned, what we talked about was a model that had been around for a number of decades prior to then which said when you introduce something disruptive as this, as this kind of change as we're talking about here into a community, the community self-segregates into five responses. The innovators or the technology enthusiasts are very quick to embrace it. They're fascinated by just figuring out how does it work. And shortly thereafter, the early adopters get involved because they're thinking, I don't care how it works, but I want to figure out if this couldn't really be a game changer. So early adopters or visionaries are interested in game changing. So like Mark Andreessen wanted to know how the internet worked and he, he made something called Mosaic, which became the Netscape Navigator, which became the world's current browser. But Jeff Bezos wanted to figure out how it could change retail commerce. So Mark was an innovator and Jeff was a visionary, an early adopter. Now the, the most of us in this room are neither. Most of us in this room are either in the early majority, which means I'll do it when I see you do it, but not before. So are you doing it yet? Hmm? No, 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 me neither. Good, okay, good, okay. Oh, 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 you are, you are, you, you, oh, sh me too. I'm in, I'm in, I'm in, okay. So just think of pragmatists as the ultimate herd animal, okay, go ahead. And conservatives who are going, be my guest, right? Knock yourself out, I'll watch, okay? I will wait as long as I can and then eventually I'll capitulate, but when I capitulate, I wanna be at the low end of it's already sorted out, not the high end of figuring it out. And then the laggards who are pretty sure that this is all an instrument of the devil. <laughs> so what we discovered with this thing, the interesting thing we discovered about it is, when you actually play this out over time, the first two groups actually were predisposed to go very early. They actually embraced new things. They wanted to create a gap between themselves and the rest of us because they were gonna have this huge head start and as a result, they were gonna catapult themselves to the head of their, you know, their competitive stack and, and win the game. And that created, and meanwhile, the pragmatists are going, well, are you doing it? No, not me neither, okay, good. So that created a thing we ended up calling the early market, followed by the chasm. And the chasm was simply that lull in the adoption of any disruptive innovation. We then found out that you could start the innovation on the other side of the chasm, but with a very different value proposition. Instead of saying, look at all the wonderful things you can do, which is what the early market was about, in the bowling alley, it was all about, look at all the horrible problems that you can solve. 
So when you crossed the chasm, it was all about finding a really painful, broken, mission, uh, mission critical business process, a use case that was just like, oh my God, this thing's driving us crazy. If you can fix this, even though it's new technology and I'm a pragmatist, I'll put in with you because frankly, I can't fix it with my existing resources. So I'm in trouble, I need help. And so that's, that's how, so it's interesting, innovations had to, you had to light the fire twice. You light the fire with the positive energy of the early market, and then that kind of begins to uh, flutter, and so you have to go over and light the fire with the negative fixes uh, 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 of the bowling alley. As the stuff catches on in the bowling alley, think of the bowling pins as like kindling, think of specific use cases that get going, get going, get going. Eventually there's enough adoption that the, you are, you are, you are, you are, okay, me too. And so the tornado was simply the opposite of the chasm. The chasm was, I'm not ready yet. I don't see you guys doing it. We're not doing it. The tornado was, I see everybody doing it. I don't want to be left behind. I'm jumping in. And it causes this amazingly jerky response to technology adoption, which every time you induce, introduce technology into your community, so think about your supply chain community, think about your own company, you will have this model in your own company. You'll have early adopters, you'll have a chasm, you'll have pragmatists in pain, you'll have pragmatists coming on, and the object is to get the technology to Main Street. Okay? That's where you're trying to go. Now in this thing, the question you have to ask yourself is, when, when's the best time for my company to join in this parade? And what we've learned is that there's four times to do it, and each one has its case. So as you look at this slide, you should be thinking about, and this is a good slide to share with your colleagues, to say, when do we want to do this? If you want to go early, the key thing is you, you expect to get a significant competitive advantage by going early. You are intending to distance yourself from the crowd. The, the, the industry isn't quite ready yet, so you're going to have to put together a very specific project with a lot of expertise from a lot of people potentially in this room. And you're going to focus on performance, and frankly, price is whatever price is. Because if you get this huge competitive advantage, whatever this project costs is mouse nuts. You're, you're changing the world. Okay? If you don't buy into that, if you say, boy, that sounds like a great idea for Fortune magazine, but maybe not for my company, then you say, OK, well, what about the next one? Do you have a broken process? Do you have a process that right now is really uh, putting a knife kind of at, 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 at the heart of your enterprise? Is there something putting you at risk? You need a solution to that process. You don't care about the technology. I don't care what the solution is. I just need a solution. And therefore, you're going to focus on the performance of that solution. But by the way, it has to be at a reasonable price. You can't, you can't, you don't, you're, you're, what you're going to do is take the budget that you're using today with a crappy solution that doesn't really work and take that money and put it to work in a new solution. So that's the budget you have to work with. You can't just raise funds, right? So it's got to be a performance at a price. In the tornado, it's more about, okay, this is the way the world's going. We've got to get on the bandwagon. This is how you improve productivity. It's very much a product orientation. Who has the best products? Who's the market leader? You know, what's the standard? I just want to get what everybody else is getting. And you focus on price performance. And I want a good deal. Okay? And if you're going to go even later, it's like, okay, it's, you know, we, got, we milked the hell. We sweated every system that we bought 15, 20 years ago, but they really are running out of gas. I want to reduce costs going forward. I have to have a systems orientation, and I want to focus on price and total cost of ownership. All four of those are totally legitimate strategies. And the question is, which one would you apply to the situation you're in front of? And don't let somebody blackmail you into picking a different one if you think one is right. Sometimes Silicon Valley types want to say that the top one is right and the bottom one is wrong. It's not true. Each one is, is fit for a purpose. So just to bring this to a close, last slide, because sometimes people say, you know, well, I had a great conference, but what am I going to do when I get back to the office on Monday? I would say, you know, just you know, recover. But, but, uh, but in addition, what would you do? So how would you say if I had a checklist to play this game, how would I play it? Well, the first thing I would encourage you to do is say, okay, sit down with your line of business, colleagues, your IT colleagues, and say, what are our moments of engagement? If you do nothing else but that, it'll bring an interesting focus to every other decision you make for the rest of the year. In that context, having determining what systems of engagement would have the biggest impact on our, on, on our uh, effectiveness in these moments, that's the key that's the key imagining question. That's the one that gets you saying, OK, so this is where I want to double click or triple click going forward. And then where, are, where is that system in the technology adoption lifecycle? 
And wherever it is, can our organization sign up for a early market or bowling alley or tornado uh, endeavor? Are we, are, does that fit us? Because sometimes the right answer is not necessarily the right answer for your, your team. So you have to figure out what are we up for? The fourth thing then is inevitably you want to bring in outside help, which is what makes a conference like this so darn important because there's a bunch of, of partner expertise in the room. It goes way beyond GT Nexus. And in fact, some of the partner expertise in the room may just be other customers and clients talking to each other to help each other out. But engage with outside help. This is not a natural act. Systems of engagement is not a natural outgrowth of systems of record. The IT people you hired to do this are probably not confident or qualified to do the other. And then the fifth and final thing is take an agile approach. Agile is actually a technical word these days. It means you, you prototype, iterate, prototype, iterate. You have, you have a small group of people who are willing to be the guinea pigs, and you work the system and work the system and work the system until you get to something that works pretty well. And you use the user experience as your critical test. Not any, and if the user experience isn't fabulous, keep working, because the whole key to collaboration and communication is to have users who are, who are doing this in a graceful and facile way. So that's what I wanted to share with you today. I, uh, you've got a half of a program uh, coming up for you, and I hope you enjoy it very much. I'm going to ask Dave to come up here and get you on with the rest of your day. Thanks a lot. Enjoy talking to you.